coming back down with the empty stretcher and everybody's running around the everybody's running around the emergency department the code cart is being pushed into this patient's room and i'm like what the hell's going on so i threw the bed in the, into the empty room ran over to my room and they're arresting my guy what oh, crap See, yeah just get ready to get discharged yeah literally i was gonna discharge him Hello, and welcome to the Art of Emergency Nursing podcast. This is where we share stories for inspiration, entertainment, and encouragement, because we all know emergency nurses have the best stories. Now here's your host, Kevin McFarland. Hey, everybody. Kevin McFarland here. Welcome back to the Art of Emergency Nursing. I have another great podcast planned for you today. Now, first, I have to always remind you, don't forget to hit subscribe. Make sure that you're not missing any of these episodes. Make sure that you're subscribed to this podcast and definitely make sure you're sharing this podcast with your friends, your peers, people you work with, people you like, people you don't like. Everybody needs to hear this podcast. Today's guest on the podcast is a, an emergency nurse, a nurse educator, a nurse leader who's been involved both at the chapter, state, and even national level of the ENA. He's one of my favorite people to see at the conference. Whenever I see him, oh my gosh, we just have a great time together. Um, and interestingly enough, I met him before I got really active in ENA. And he was one of the ones that really encouraged me to get involved in ENA and be an active member. So I, I always thank him for that. You are going to love today's episode with my friend, Stephen Jewell. Let's All right. Oh, Kevin. Thanks for having me here this morning. My name is Stephen Jewell. I am a bedside night shift charge nurse working in a level one facility in San Antonio, Texas. I've been at this facility for about nine years now, as of today's date. Uh, before then, I worked at a level four uh, inner city emergency department. And then before that, another level one hospital, the uh, sister facility in San Antonio, Texas. So I've been around a little bit. Uh, before that, and this is probably one of the things that a lot of people don't know about me, so I'm going to give you a little bit of a uh, little history, that nursing is a second career. And I think you and I have talked about this before over the years that we've known each other. My first career, I am retired from the United States Navy. Not right. Impressive. I had, a, I had a great career, but I had a great career because of what my job was. And everybody, you know, I should say everybody, I hate all those all inclusive words, but the majority of the people thought I was a nursing in the Navy, but actually what my job was, I would play trumpet for the Navy band. <laughs> <laughs> uh huh. You tell me that I was sitting there going, what was your job in the Navy? Yeah. Okay. So, so I, I went to a recruiter back in the mid eighties trying to you know, get out of San Antonio, because I'm a, I'm a local boy, trying to get out of San Antonio. If I knew I went Army or Air Force, I know I'd end up back in San Antonio because San Antonio has a huge base for both of those services. So I wanted to get out and see the world. Hence the reason I joined the Navy. Went to the recruiter. I had a great ASVAB score. I already had like 40 hours of college hours. So he hooked me up. I was going to do um, nuclear sonography on a submarine. They're going to send me to Jacksonville, Florida. And then I was going to go to Groton, Connecticut for my first duty station aboard a, um, a fast attack submarine. So I was actually looking very excited towards doing that. Went to boot camp. In my first week of boot camp, I found out I was colorblind. <sighs> yeah. So that contract is no yeah. longer good. Yeah. So they made me this really great job offer of being a boatswain. I had no idea what a boatswain was. So I was kind of excited until I realized that they're kind of like the housekeepers of the boat. You know, the ones that are scrubbing the barnacles off the side of the ship, cleaning the trash out and that kind of stuff. So I was like, man, that's that's not for me. So during boot camp, I was struggling, trying to find another job. There was a band on one day marching from point A to point B as we were marching in the opposite direction in boot camp. And I thought it was like a, a second duty, a collateral duty that these people did because they were wearing un Navy uniforms. And come to find out, the Navy actually has military bands. A full-time so, band. Yeah. So I, I auditioned for the band in boot camp um, and made made the band. So luckily enough, I, I guess you could say I had a good career again. 
because it didn't didn't do what I was wanting to do, but it actually turned out in my favor. You know, long service, saw a lot of points of the globe, and uh, now I'm retired. So oh, that's, that's funny. So the band, so the so the band is your full time job in the navy. Yeah, the band was my full time job in the navy. Now, did you play uh, the trumpet before? Was that something you did before? Oh, you yeah, 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 yeah. For for every military service, for every band, whether it's Air Force, Army, Navy, Marines, whatever, you already have to know how to play that instrument. So you still audition, and they don't just take you because you know how to play. You actually have to audition and pass the audition. So that was that was a plus. I I've been playing since man second grade. I was in the San Antonio Youth Symphony. I played with a couple of symphonies throughout the United States. So I had already acquired a, uh, I guess you could say, a resume for music before I ever went to the military, but didn't even think about joining the band because I was so enamored with the idea of going on a fast attack submarine. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's funny. Well, what what a what a strange twist and turn. And hey, if it works out, yeah. So we were we were sitting in a uh, doctor's office, and um, I got assigned to the Naval War College in Rhode Island. And uh, Justin was our son. My son was diagnosed with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. We left a doctor's appointment, and Jamie, my wife, and I, we both sat in the car, and we were like, I have no idea what the hell that doc was trying to tell us. I got like maybe one out of every hundred words as to what he was trying to describe. So got back home, really was going to a library, a school of nursing to try to find out what some of these words that they were talking about. We sat down during dinner one night, it was a couple of weeks later, and I told Jamie, I was like, man, one of us has got to get got into gotta get into healthcare so that we can understand what the hell is going on with him and you know, be an advocate and provide information and understand what they're talking about. So I had already had some science classes underneath my belt. So that's how I got into got into nursing. I got into it to be an advocate for my own son. That's awesome. Now, yeah. now, did you were you when did you go to school for nursing while you were still in the Navy? Yeah, yeah. I started out doing night school, doing the uh, general ed requirements. Um, the good thing, one of the benefits of night school being in the military is if you take classes on the base, they know that you're going to be deployed. So it doesn't go against you in the, in the event that you have to leave school in order to do you know, a two-week or a six-month tour. They know that, so it doesn't go against you. So the, school, the schools that we went to um, worked with you so that when you came back, you would just pick up where you left. So that was... That was a godsend. So they, awesome. they, they did really good. Yeah. <clears throat> That's awesome. So what, so you told me what, how you got into nursing. At what point in your career were you sure you made the right choice? <laughs> okay. Oh, another funny story. I found out that I made the right choice in nursing in nursing school during my labor and delivery rotation. I had, so many jokes. So many jokes I can insert right here. That know, I'm not going to. I know. I get this all the time because my my first clinical day, the first week of clinicals, I was assigned to labor and delivery. You know, you, you do your rotations, postpartum, um, NICU, EADS, all that kind of stuff. Well, week one, I was in labor and delivery. I got, she assigned me to labor and delivery first. The <laughs> hospital that I was going to, I knew I already had bad parking, so I wanted to be there early. So I got there, man, for the clinicals that started at 7.30, got there like at 6 o'clock, 5.45, just because I was afraid of, of you know, I, I don't want to be late for this, right? So I, sh I showed up real early, and there was a mother that was walking on the unit with me. Of course, they could tell we're not together because I'm in my uniform with the patch on, that kind of stuff. And uh, the charge nurse was getting ready to get off her shift, and she goes, just go help her get into a room. I went and helped her get into a room. Uh, I guess it was about 7 o'clock. The night shift charge nurse was like, you know, Dr. S Dr. X is coming in. They're, do they're going to do a cyclage removal on that lady you put in nine. You want to go help the doc? I'm like, yeah. I had no idea what a cyclage was. I had no idea what it was. So I'm like, okay, great learning opportunity. So I walked in, and what the job was is she wanted me to hold the flashlight over her shoulder because there was no lighting 
in the room. So I needed to hold this flashlight. So the doctor gave me a, a face mask to put on and show me where to hold the light and that kind of stuff. And now, mind you, I'm, I'm a young kid. I'm a young guy. Um, been already been married for a couple of years, but I've never been in an examination of this nature. So this is my first. I this is the first time I've ever seen a speculum used. So I'm watching this, and I am just in amazed is what's going on. Yeah. She keeps oh, she keeps cranking up that speculum. I'm like, and she's saying, I can't find it. I can't find it. And I wanted to look at her. I'm like, what are you looking for? Maybe I can help you. I have no idea what you're looking for. So real quick, she found it. She zipped it out. She's done it. She's done. She's already taking her gloves off. She's already walking out the door. And I'm like, wait, 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 wait. What did you do? So I walked out in the hallway. And I'm like, I have no idea what you're looking for. So she explained to me what a cerclage was. And I'm like, oh, that's actually really impressive what they can do. Mind you, I'm sure this has been around for decades, but again, I've never known what it was. Lunchtime comes around, and there's a mother that comes in that's half that's in active labor, right? So I skipped lunch that day so I can help with this vaginal delivery. And this is all going on, and I was like, I was in awe, just amazed at the beauty of all what was going on, right? Justin was born by C-section, so we both missed out on the vaginal delivery. So I'm watching this, and I'm like, this is so impressive to watch, I, for lack of better words, the, the symphony of all the moving parts working together, not people not having to talk to each other to know what their role is. I was in awe. I was on cloud nine. At the end of the day, it's about four o'clock now, another mother walks in for a scheduled delivery followed by a C-section. She was having twins. My clinical faculty comes up and I'm like, I want to stay for this. Now I'm going to be able to watch a C-section. I'm going to be able to help out in a C-section. So she's like, yes, you can help out. You just can't touch patients. If I'm not on the hospital, you can't do patient care. You can watch, just don't do anything. So the nurse that, that the nurse all day was like, man, Steve is having a great day. I got his back. We'll make sure he doesn't do anything wrong. So I go into surgery, we go into labor and delivery room. We induce her. She delivers the first baby. We go off into the OR, which is like three doors down, go into the OR and I'm helping. My job was to count towels. Might be a minor job for all my OR nurses and labor and delivery nurses, but for me, man, that was like cloud nine. I knew I didn't want to make a mistake. So I'm doing this, I'm helping out, watching the C-section, see how they did everything. Now I'm looking at it from a medical point of view. I got done at the end of the day. I probably got home like at eight. Nine o'clock that evening, and I was on cloud nine. Cloud nine. I went home and I told my wife, I'm like, you know what? I have a feeling I'm going to be a labor and delivery nurse. I had such an impressive day. So whenever it came to whoever didn't want to work in labor and delivery, traded shifts with me. Because I didn't I, I'm not a NICU nurse. I know I'm not a burper feeder kind of guy, right? I want to get my hands in there and do something. So I kept trading to go back to labor and delivery. Um, at the end of the at the end of the semester, the director of that department knew that I worked as a tech in another emergency room. He said, "Hey, if you want to pick up some shifts up here, pick up some shifts because it seems like you're really enjoying this. And if it works out, we'll see what you can do about getting a job here." And great, I've got one semester left in school, and I've already got a job offer. So I started doing some PRN shifts up there in this labor and delivery unit. Um, Graduation, now graduation is coming around the corner. Now I'm trying to apply for jobs, that kind of stuff. And the director of labor and delivery offered me a job. Two weeks later, I got a job offer from the emergency room I was working at. So now I'm tossed up. Do I do emergency nursing? Do I do labor and delivery? Well, I'm working in the emergency room one night and a code, code blue comes in, CPR in progress, right? We get done with that one. I get done. Do a little debriefing, do a little bit of debriefing, got home, and I'm like, you know what? Now, as much fun as labor and delivery is, that's where I think I need it. I really excelled in that cardiac arrest, and uh, I think that's what I want to do. Those are the people that I think really need nurses more. They're at the, you know, the worst part of their life. You know, the struggle mm -hmm. is real. So 
Yeah, it was at that moment that I realized, following that cardiac arrest, that yeah, I was going to be an emergency room nurse. That's and awesome. that was the job offer I took. How cool is that? Yeah. So you you never told me what a clef, a clefage? Uh, cerclage. Cerclage. So a cerclage. It's it's a C. C e r c l a g e. Cerclage is a uh, stitch that they put, uh, for lack of I guess for better anatomy, in the vagina to keep the uterus. It's for um, uh, and all my other nurse friends are going to be laughing at me because uh, incompetent cervix. Okay. So it's not strong enough to keep the, the cervix yeah. closed while the baby expands and gets bigger and that kind of stuff. So she can have an imminent delivery just because her cervix is weak. So what the cerclage does is the stitch keeps it closed. Oh, okay. So pretty much when you, when you, yeah, when you remove the cerclage, you're almost guaranteed that the baby's going to be delivered within 24 hours. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yep. Never heard of that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was yeah, this is back in the day before internet and comments searching Google and that kind of stuff. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me about a patient who changed the way you practice. Oh man. So the, the one that's coming to my mind is not so much. It's it, the, the patient's story was definitely life-changing, you know, career-changing in terms of being a nurse. But I think it was mostly the, the, the team I was working with that helped shape this logic. So I was a GN. Maybe... Man, I don't even think I was three or four months out of nursing school. But like I said, it was in this emergency department that I'd already been working in for like four or five years. Taking care of this guy, I'm I was already I'm, I'm already done being precepted and that kind of stuff. I felt pretty confident with my with myself in the emergency department. They had put me in, I guess you could say the acute care area, which I mean it doesn't really matter because most of the emergency departments don't. You know, they do pod nursing, whatever. So you get whatever kind of patient you can in any of the beds. So I, I've got this patient. I got him at shift change at 7 p.m. Um, who was there for, I guess you could say, chest pain. That was resolved. We were going to send him home, but we need to do that delta troponin in order to send him home, just to make sure, you know, what you know what a delta trope is for. So the EKG, the EKG was already crappy. But it didn't look much different than his EKG that we had on record before, right? So I felt comfortable with the doc that was on. Uh, my preceptor was the charge nurse that night, so I know I had resources. Um, the patient's uh, children were there. And I'm talking, this guy was maybe, maybe in his early 60s, late 50s, somewhere around there. I had another patient in the other room, which was intubated. Got an ICU bed for her. So I was taking her upstairs, coming back down with the empty stretcher, and everybody's running around the everybody's running around the emergency department. The code cart is being pushed into this patient's room. And I'm like, what the hell's going on? So I threw the bed in the, into the empty room, ran over to my room, and they're arresting my guy. Holy crap. See, you guys just get ready to get discharged. Yeah. Literally, I was going to discharge him once I came back from taking this lady upstairs. It's like maybe 11 o'clock now. The children are still at the bedside. I'm, I, I'm, a, I'm a believer in, in family at the bedside for these kind of things, right? And we worked him an hour, maybe an hour and a half. And then we, we called him. Dude, uh -huh. that was like, that was legit my very first patient, my patient to expire. Hmm. Somebody under my charge that expired. Dude, I went into the break room and I, man, I have never had this feeling before. So I went out and I talked to the doc um, in, you know, in their, in their little area, which is kind of seclusion. And I'm like, what 
what did I miss? Was there something that I didn't see that maybe could have prevented this? And he's like, no, this dude, he legit just had a bad heart. It was just a ticking time bomb. His troponin never changed. Like I said, his EKG was crappy. Uh, but outside of that, there was nothing Im Im impressive him enough to really admit him. Uh, I talked to my charge nurse, like I said, who was my preceptor. And we talked about the patient care and that kind of stuff. But really, there was no warning. He legit, when I was taking her upstairs to the ICU, he was sitting on the edge of the bed, already dressed, ready to go. He knew that we were going to be discharging him when I come back. You know, luckily enough, I didn't take, it, take out his IV. I don't, I don't, I, that's one thing I did learn is don't take out IVs until you actually have paperwork in your hand kind of deal. Um, talked to the family and the daughter was like, no, he's, I guess he's been on a transplant list for a long time. Uh, refused transplants. He knew mm. his, his time was up. He was just biding time. And I'm like, uh, I, I was in, I, I was in awe, just taken back at the, uh, like the the easiness, the nonchalant way that the fa the son and daughter, who are my age, were were talking about their dad's passing, with him still in the room, it's how it was so calm for them that he finally passed, kind of deal. And I'm sitting here wondering, you know, what did I miss? And am, am, am I going to be that kind of a bad nurse? But the transit, the team that I worked with, my management, they were all in big support. There was no education that needed to be done. This was legit, just a, a flat out just case happens. of it was his time. Yeah, just happened. Yeah. So that was that was definitely changing. And that happened early on in my career. I think that's one of the hardest things to realize as a nurse is that like the reality is, is some people die like, it's, yeah. like it, and it, and sometimes it's hard to realize that like, it sometimes it takes a minute to be like, you know, you were always like, Oh, we got to fight this. This is terrible. And you're like, dude, it's going to happen to every one of us. And, right. and you know, there's, there's different times where you're like, okay, not this guy, not this time. But a lot of times you're like, you know, and sometimes you're just there to, be witness to what's happening. So, yeah. Yeah. So. I agree. What's the best advice a nurse mentor ever gave you? <sighs> uh, best advice is probably something that I have never been able to do. That's the advice you didn't take. Is that is that what you is that what you thought I asked here? <laughs> no, no, no. They, she, I, I've been fortunate enough that I've I've come across some amazing nurses, some amazing physicians, and equally as impressive technicians and and military medics. Uh, the advice was, um, and you you probably heard this before because it's a uh, we use it all over the place. It's, you know, don't take your work home with you. It's hard. And yeah, I've, mm -hmm. I have never been, I guess you could say, I've never been successful with that. Because yeah. I think, you know, there's, there's days, I, I, was, I was actually talking to somebody about this probably a month or two ago. I was like, I am so fortunate enough that my car knows how to get me home. Mm, that's scary. There's, you know, I get, I have an hour, I have a half hour to a 40 minute drive to and from work every day. So there's been days that I've gotten into my car after work, gotten home, had no recollection of the drive home. Wow. Just trying to recap and grasp the, the chaos that I just left. Hmm. So that's, that's the best advice, um, but something I've not been able to accomplish in the years that I've been doing this. Yeah. <clears throat> Now you work for a military hospital. What do you like about working for a military hospital? Uh, there's there's a lot of advantages of working in a military hospital. Let me let me let me let me switch up the question a little bit. Uh, the the emergency room that I work in is the only level one Department of Defense trauma center globally. There is no other 
emergency department owned by the DOD that's a level one. This is a level one. Why is that so impressive? Is the fact that there's so much research. And the fact that it's a military hospital, we get to play with some of the newest and greatest toys. You know, um, one of the things that our trauma surgeons, our emergency medicine, our emergency doctors, and our medics, because our medics get spun up to do the same kind of flight job. <clears throat> Being in the military, you know, they're going to go down range and they need to be prepared for whatever. So that's why we get to co play with some of the coolest and newest toys and, and gadgets. Um, one of the most recent ones is uh, the Reboa. We got Reboa in our emergency department doing things with Reboa before things were really even starting to get published. So that's kind of cool to be on the forefront of all of that. Uh, same thing goes with ECMO. We have an amazing ECMO team that travels the globe to go pick up patients no matter where they are in a C-130. Wow. That's all that plane was meant for was to transport that type of critical type, critical care patient. Wow. So that's the thing that I like looking at my military hospital. So. Now, I, I remember you once saying something about um getting patients across the globe how long it oh, takes. Okay. yeah yeah that's again that goes back to the one, one of the strengths of the military is all the training that our doctors nurses and, and medics do before they go down range they definitely spin them up so that they're the best at what they can be for the moment at hand so there's a lot of simulation labs uh, a lot of training a lot of live Live training, of course, at, at our level one. So a lot of people come in and rotate through our emergency department. Um, one of the things that we got, which you're, which you're alluding to, is, is I guess you could say a, a kudos that we've been having. This is probably started all the way back in 2008, 2009, is the Air Force, which manages the flights to and from um, downrange, wherever they may be, Africa, Greece. Uh, most common that people know about is mm -hmm. Afghanistan, Iraq, and that kind of stuff. So what the Air Force has been able to do is from the point of injury, and I said, from the point of injury to my emergency department, they can get them there within 18 hours. Now, it's I, I, I was explaining this during a lecture, uh, I think at the Austin DNA conference last year, and I'm, I'm talking to the, the audience about how impressive it is to get people from the point of injury to my emergency room in 18 hours. And people didn't catch up on the fact that I was talking global. They thought I was talking about my own city. So that, well, that's really not all that damn impressive, dude. <laughs> but from the point of injury, so you're dealing with somebody that's downrange, infantry, as we'll pick on it in Afghanistan. In Afghanistan, gets shot. From the point that he gets shot, he or she gets shot, to our facility is less than 18 hours. That's that's impressive. That's, yep, that's that's from the point of injury, which is a hotbed, it's a hot zone, to the combat surgical hospital, to probably Bagram Air Force Base in Germany, to Virginia for refueling, and then into San Antonio in under 18 hours. It's pretty impressive. That is pretty impressive. With, with and, an elite medical team taking care of them the whole time. Yeah, and that's that's the Air Force. And it's not just, it's it's not your typical flight. It's not your paramedic, it's not your RN. It's your surgeon, it's your uh, pulmonologist, both physicians, uh, another physician on board, two respiratory technicians, two or three registered nurses, uh, a slew of medics, and then other specialists whether they're physicians or nurses and they're primarily air force that manages those transports. So yeah, mm -hmm. the air force has done an amazing job in fine tuning how everything comes down to the exact minute. Wow. That's cool. Yeah. That's really cool. Now you're pretty involved in ENA. You mentioned, um, you mentioned the ENA conference. You're pretty involved in ENA, aren't you? Yeah, I guess you could say that. What, tell me a little bit about some of your successes in, in ENA. Some of my successes. So I got involved in the ENA. I became a member right out of nursing school. 
and I was trying to, it was my, my membership was coming up for renewal, my very first membership, and not a whole lot occurred during that first year. You know, it really, again, it goes back to what we hear all the time, you know, what's ENA membership or what's AAC in membership or ANA or AONL, whatever. What's that membership mean to me? What, what does it mean to me? For me, it was education. I think you need to educate me more, right? So I went to our local chapter and I'm like, what is it that you're providing for me? What kind of education are you providing for me? Well, we do TNCC and ENPC. Uh, I can get that at work. What else are you doing for me? So there wasn't a whole lot going on. So I started getting involved. I realized that the only way that I'm going to be able to get what I want out of it is I'm going to have to actually step up and work towards what I want out of it. So I got more and more active in the local chapter. Um, got them, got the board of directors and some of the other committee chair people to approve having me put on a CEN review course. So the CEN review course went off fabulously, even <laughs> even better than what I thought it would have been. The profits that we got from that CEN review course, the profits alone matched that chapter's annual budget. Wow. So, yeah. Of course, everybody was all excited about that. So ever since then, that was in 2013, 2012. Ever since 2012, we have held either a CEN, a TCRN, or a CPEN review course every year. Just because it wasn't so much, it was about the certification, but it's about the education. And then a year or two later, we started providing an annual educational event that at one point got up to two days two tracks of education every hour. That's cool. So you had a lot of choices of education. So huge success in this in, in San Antonio was the fact that, yeah, now on an average annual, we're probably doing 80 hours of continuing edu- education every year. And that's besides TNCC and ENPC. That's flat up webinars, educational conferences, view courses, and that kind of stuff. So for me, that's a big win. Um, awesome. I, I, I do like teaching. I like teaching, but I like bedside to bedside teaching. Um, I, could, I couldn't be a didactic teacher at a nursing school. Those guys are phenomenal. I, I, I could not do that. Um, so I like teaching my peers. I like doing the nurse to nurse. So that's, that's why I do that. That's, that's the success for the San Antonio chapter. Um, in Texas, one of the big successes that I had in Texas that I'm very happy about is as president in 2018, I established what's called the Council of Presidents. What the Council of Presidents is, is during my president-elect year, there was a handful of chapters that were not meeting the requirements to continue being a chapter in either the Texas ENA guidelines or ENA guidelines. So I started visiting these chapter meetings throughout the state that entire year. I was in all corners of the state talking to the chapter officers about what is it that you need from Texas in order to be successful in ensuring that your chapter stays active. So I got a got a all this all the all the comments were pretty much the exact same thing. Well, we only have two or three people coming to our, our meetings. So I feel bad that there's only two or three people. I would hold for um, active chapters like Dallas, Tex, uh, Dallas, Houston, uh, Fort Worth, uh, Austin. I want to be like those chapters where they have you know two or three dozen people attending their meetings. So really, what they were thinking was, in order to be a successful chapter, you had to have that many people attending your meetings. So me visiting them actually told them that even those bigger chapters still struggle to get people to their meetings. Yeah, for sure. What what makes you successful in your chapter is what we're established to do, and that's education. That's our 501c3 status, is the fact that you have to provide education. So once these people, once the chapter started realizing that all your struggles are the same exact struggles that the larger chapters are having, So I decided to put this Council of Presidents together, and what it was was to help past Texas ENA presidents, um, any past ENA presidents, board members, 
Texas ENA board members and chapter officers to come specifically for an hour so that you can work together to see what it is that we can do to make our chapter even bigger, even better. Now, since 2018, January, every single chapter, every single one of them since then, including today, since then, has been current on what is re required to be a chapter. Two other chapters have been so successful that they've tripled their membership. And in 2018, we also started a new chapter to help support some of these larger chapters just because the size of Texas. So yeah. that was a huge success for me on the, on the state level was the creation of, these, of this Council of Presidents bringing everybody together and talking about the struggles and realizing <laughs> we're in the same damn boat. So, we all have the same problem. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was a plus. And then if you want me to continue, we can also talk about the ENA Foundation. What did you do at the well, ENA Foundation? Yeah, for the ENA Foundation, the same thing. In 2018, while I was serving as president of Texas, I also served as the chairperson of the ENA Foundation in 2018. Now, that was a challenging year. 2018 was a very challenging year. Um, in the fact, um, our son passed away July of 2017. <sighs> so 2018 provided our, our, our first. Our first Mother's Day without Justin. Our first Father's Day without Justin. Our first New Year's without Justin. So all these firsts were happening at the exact same time I was serving as the Texas president and the ENA Foundation chairperson. Oh. On, the, on the national level, serving as chairperson, the executive director of the foundation resigned in January right before the state and chapter leaders orientation. So for the first nine months going into Pittsburgh that year, that September conference, I had no executive director for wow. 2018. Um, the chief business development officer, Terrence Sykes, uh, was my point of contact for that entire year. Wow. So we went those we went through those first together, my wife and I. Um, Texas was I would consider extremely successful in the fact that um, our budget ballooned. Uh, our education got even better in the terms that we're providing TNCC and e and instructor courses, Council of Presidents. And on the foundation level, on the national level, the, we almost, I guess we did, uh, just go over two times, I guess you could say 100% of the money raised than what we did the previous year. Wow. So we raised ultimately over $500,000 in 2018. That 100% of it went back to academic scholarships and research grants. Um, I was appointed to be ENA's liaison with ASEPS Foundation. So again, in 2018, up until just recently here in 2020, um, I served as the liaison between the two foundation boards. And we started a collaborative research project between ASEP and ENA um, for emergency nursing. Uh, you should say emergency medicine together. So we in increased those research opportunities. Um, yeah, it was an amazing year. It was a very amazing year, a great year for, for everybody. That's awesome. Yeah, more scholarships were given out. Um, and we gave out almost three, 400% more research grants than we did in the previous years. Wow, that's cool. Yeah. Have they been able to maintain that success? So yes, in 2019, Mickey Fornes mm -hmm. was the chair was the uh, chairperson of the ENA Foundation, and it's it, we always it's always it's always been kind of a joke. I served on the board for five years before I became chairperson. Um, it's kind of a joke is that you always want to do better than your predecessor, right? Well, I. The predecessor before me was Chris Gisness. Um, she was my predecessor, and my goal was just to just to beat her uh, state challenge giving by I don't know it was like ten percent 
So I think it was like $180,000 and my goal was 195. Or I think it was like, I think it was actually lower. I think it was 130 and my goal was 135. So if I met 135, I'd be extremely happy. That year, like I said, we made close to $500,000. So that was phenomenal what we did that year. That's amazing. <laughs> Mickey, <laughs> Mickey, who followed me in 2019, um, did the exact same thing. She beat me by a dollar. And that was, <laughs> <laughs> we always, I always joke around with um, <clears throat> Patty Coons Howard, who was the president that year, um, that Mickey was chairperson, that um, somebody had to pay a couple of extra bucks to, to beat me from the year before. So that's a little, little bantering joke that we have going on. And this year, um, Jim Holtz is the chairperson. And with coronavirus and, slowing down. We're not going to have a conference this year as, as what we were hoping for. Um, it's going to be interesting to see what happens with, with the fundraising then, yeah. how, how the foundation does. Yeah. That's going to be a tough, it's going to be a tough year for the foundation because I think it's a tough year with, with coronavirus. I think it's a tough year for everyone. I know we've certainly felt it at the organization level in my chapter Yeah, that we're not getting quite as much, um, we're not getting quite as much. Uh, we're not getting any new engagement, um, and that just makes it really hard. It makes it yeah. really hard. Well, it's, so. it's you know when everybody's struggling, you know it's 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 kind of hard on a foundation level to to ask people for money when you don't know if their significant other even has a job. It's true. So it yeah, there, there wasn't that much. Um, advertising this year for the state challenge just because that was at the height of the coronavirus. You know? Yeah. 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 The last question I always ask people is a hard one, but I always ask the question, what are three things an e earner should always remember? And what are three things they can just go ahead and forget? <laughs> oh man. For me, in particularly for the novice nurse, was to be resilient. We are, you know, that's one of the things I like working about night shift is um, we're there at night for those people that are having the worst day of their life. Yep. You know, their most vulnerable, vulnerable time. You don't know what's going to walk in that door. You don't know how you're going to react to it. You never um, know. And again, it goes back to what my preceptor said, you know, don't, don't take work home with you, but you, you can't, you just, you can't take this job thinking that you're not going to have some kind of daily burden. There's still, there's still people that I read patients that I remember to this day that were years ago. So that would, that would be one. Uh, I guess you could say two, because again, I, I'll, I'll stick with my mentors, you know, don't take work home with you. Yeah. Hopefully somebody would be successful with that better than I would be. Um, yeah, that, that'd be kind of hard. It'd be interesting yeah. to talk with some of the retired nurses to see if they were ever able to, able to do that. Yeah. You know, leave work at home. It's hard. I mean, it's, it's, hard, work, it's, hard to, it's hard to leave work at home, especially if you're in a leadership capacity, then you, you just don't get that chance. Yeah. Um, the third one I would probably say, and again, this is, this is going to go back to the listeners that are listening to today is to do some research on this one, because I'm a, I becoming more and more of a fan of this and that's imposter syndrome. That's been coming out pretty, pretty steadily now for about the last two years. Uh, some of the research of course has been gone by the wayside because of the whole coronavirus, but it would be interesting to see exactly where we go with imposter syndrome. So in the event that you don't know what imposter syndrome is, it's, we're not gonna know everything. We're expected to know a lot about a, a lot of things, but that's just enough to get us through our job, yeah. especially the things that we see all the time. But if there's ever a point that you think you're above your, you know, you're over your head, you're getting confused, you're lost, you have no idea what's going on, ask for help. You know, I, one of the things I do when I'm precepting 
is, and like I said, we rotate through a lot of students, is it does not matter what you do to a patient. If you think you did something wrong, come find me sooner than later. I can almost, without a certainty of a doubt, change what you just did. So that's imposter syndrome. If you yep. get over your head, look for those people that you know that you could trust to say, hey, I need some help. That's going to help you and not berate you. Yeah. Yep. It's, uh, <sighs> it's, it's definitely one of those like, yeah, come get me sooner than later. Come get some help. Own up yeah. to what you did and let's move on. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I had a, I was precepting this young guy. He was a young guy. Of course, he was a new nurse and it was a, for a GI bleed. Uh, we gave him the ADF protonics, and now we're starting the protonics drip and the Santastatin. And uh, he wasn't paying attention to his drips. And the protonics drip that he did, 250 milligrams in a 250 bag, um, <laughs> he accidentally infused in like 15 minutes. Oh. He wasn't paying attention to the fact that he hadn't put it in the um, in the pump. It was just. <laughs> wide open to gravity. Oh no. So, so he, he he got he did what he did, went out to go chart, went back in the room. He's he's a, he was nervous, you know, this is his first time with a patient that was GI bleed and you know, we'd already put in the the NG tube and this guy is just bleeding everywhere. He comes back out to me and he's like, "Uh, Stephen, that um that protonic strip it's already done. <laughs> you mean the protonic strip you just hung? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That one. Okay. Well, what do you want to do about it? Because I, I, I know what I know what the uh, what we do for overdoses on protonic strips. So, what do you want to do about it? Um, that's why I'm coming to He's like, uh, find you. <laughs> I don't really know. <laughs> so I'm like, all right. Well. First of all, let's let's go tell the ER doc what we did. So we walked over to the ER doc, who, it, luckily enough, this is a, a one of our our better physicians who also loves to teach. So um, he comes over there, and this new nurse is explaining to the doc what he did. And the kid's nervous as hell. This is, his, I guess you could say, his first medication error. Um, he's nervous, trying to tell the doc what's going on. What should I do? And the doc was like, well. There's really nothing to do. The only thing that you did today was make sure that he is not going to have acid reflux for the next two weeks. <laughs> he's like, he's going to be all right. Don't he's do gonna that. Be all he's right. going to be all right. <laughs> he's going to be all right. That's not going to hurt him. <laughs> That's funny. So fun. Yep. Three things to forget. You got the three things to remember. You got three more. Three things to forget. Oh man. I guess you could say don't forget where you've been. What do you mean by that? Put it, put a twist on that one. Because everything, everything that we do is built on experience. So don't forget where you've been. All these all these stories that we've been talking about today, all the other hundreds of stories you and I both have about patient care, don't forget those stories. That's what helps you with your next patients. You know? Um, I don't know what else to I don't know what else to forget. When it comes to our realm of the world, how much how much danger can be had if we did forget things? There's a, there yeah, I mean certainly <laughs> you can say no. true. You can go, don't, don't forget to continue learning. Uh, okay. Your job's not done. You always need to learn, be on top of everything. Um, I guess you could forget watching Grey's Anatomy, The Good Doctor. Um, that's about it. <laughs> nice. Okay. You got three. That's good. So, good job. Yeah. I think that's all the questions I have for you, dude. I appreciate you taking the time to do this with me today. Oh, yeah, man. Thanks for having me.